Good morning. Welcome to Northeast Community Church. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. We're excited to worship together with you. So wherever you are, we're going to invite you to stand and let's worship God. everybody. Thank you for joining us as we go after God's heart together. My name's Thomas. If I haven't met you yet, good morning. In fact, if you're joining us for the first time, we want to say welcome. Thank you. We'd love to hear from you. So if you're watching us on social media, maybe like or you can direct message us. Um, you can also just email the office or email me and let us know that you're uh, joining us for the first time. We'd love to be able to thank you. So you can send an email to office at necclife.org, and I'll get that message, and we'd love to thank you. 
Of course, if you've got prayer needs, uh, you can send them there as well. Let us partner with you in prayer. Our prayer team or elders, send them right there to office at nccLife.org, and we'll join with you in prayer this week uh, right along with your life groups. Now, a couple things I want to remind you about and kind of thank you in the same way is that we're doing a couple outreach things. Sean did a great job sharing last week. One is we're writing notes of encouragement and support that are going to uh, the healthcare workers, to nursing homes, to others that are in need. And it's just a way of encouraging. It doesn't cost you anything except for some time. It's a great thing for you to do uh, with your kids, with your family. And then you can even mail them to the church and we'll distribute them or you can drop them off. There's a drop box in the back of the church here in a little blue bin. You can drop them in there and then we get them to the folks that need it. Secondly, right now we're helping at Norwalk Hospital. Uh, we want to bless the frontline healthcare workers by just participating in their meal train and giving them some meals just as a way of blessing them and showing gratitude. So you can join in that effort, and if you'd like to donate towards that, we'd sure welcome it. Now, we've got a new way you can donate. You can do some of the old ways, whether you want to do something in snail mail. Uh, you can also go on the website, and you just click on the menu, go to the give part, and you can follow the instructions right there to donate. And, or you can do this right now, if you've got your phone with you, you can now text to give. So the number that you text to is 84321, and then in the message, you put the dollar amount, and you hit send. Now, if you want to specify what that's for, like tithe or offering or outreach or the Holy Spirit Fund, you can put that word in there as well, and it'll be directed towards those, those things. So if you hit send, if you do it for the first time, you'll get an, a, a text message back. You set up a little information, and then from then on, you can very easily text right from there the amounts you want to give, and it'll go towards those needs. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. I'll be back in just a little bit to share a message, but right now, Celeste is going to come tell you what's going on with our kids. So glad to, uh, to see everybody this morning. This has uh, been a fabulous week at uh, Northeast Community Church uh, with our kids. Uh, we've been having a great time every week uh, meeting together on, on Zoom. And so I hope that you have been joining us at 4 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so this week we've got some extra special stuff. We're doing some special Mother's Day crafts. So uh, so kids, go ahead and, and jump on so that you can have something special for mom. I'm going to be dropping off a little bit something uh, to you guys uh, to help you out with this. So look forward to that on uh, hopefully on Monday and then we'll meet together on Tuesday and Thursday to, to put this craft together for mom. Uh, also, like Thomas mentioned, then, uh, then I've been encouraging these kids. We've been doing a fabulous job on getting some cards together for the nursing home workers. I got some great cards in last week and I look forward to getting some more of those and just drop them in the bin at the church or uh, shoot me an email and I'll swing by and pick them up. Uh, third thing, Kids Life, is, uh, is join us online. Go ahead and check your email right now. I've sent you an email. You can set the kids up to, uh, to watch the children's service while you're watching Thomas in just a little bit. See you guys this week.
Father, for another awesome day that you have made. Father, we just pray you prepare our steps today, Lord. Guide us in everything, Lord, we do and everything we say, Father God. We raise this day up to you today. In Jesus' mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. I hope this morning that you've smiled at somebody. Maybe there's some hustle and bustle stuff going on in your house, but those that you're there with this morning, why don't you turn to them and smile? And if not, somebody's not sitting right next to you, just smile anyway, and it could be for you. Now, as we've worked through this quarantine and sheltering in place, one of the benefits has been some more time, of course, uh, with family. Uh, getting to hang out with the kids. Uh, Roxanne and I have even gotten to be school teachers. So we get to help our kids, especially our youngest son, who's still in elementary school, uh, with his schoolwork, with uh, the distance learning, all this other stuff. And sometimes as I've jumped in and tried to help, now he's in third grade, but I just like, I don't get this. How is this happening? What, how does this work? How do you find a math problem by drawing pictures? Uh, and so I try to struggle through to help him. I know some of you parents can relate, right? You've, you've, you've had some of these issues as you're trying to help uh, the kids with schoolwork. Well, not quite getting it sometimes reminded me of this little joke I heard. The story of Adam and Eve was being carefully explained in the children's Sunday school class. Following the story, the children were asked to draw some pictures that would illustrate the story. Well, little Bobby drew a picture. I don't know why it's always little Bobby, but apparently as little Bobby drew a picture of a car with three people in it. In the front seat was a man, in the back seat a man and a woman. The teacher was at loss to understand how this illustrated the lesson of Adam and Eve in the garden. Little Bobby was prompt in his explanation. He said, why? This is God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. Nobody here laughed. Maybe you laughed at home. Well, I know we've been trying to make it through quarantine, all that other stuff. We're wrapping up this series, When God's People Pray. We've been talking about this together over the last few weeks. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I asked you this question on Friday. If you get my update, you saw it. But how many of you would say that there's a prayer that you could pray for other Christ followers that would help them have a fuller understanding of who they are in Christ how many of you'd want to pray that prayer for them? So join me again. And if you want to pray that kind of prayer, raise your hand. I hope hands are going up everywhere. I think we'd all want to pray that kind of prayer for fellow Christ followers that we love. So if we want them to have that fuller understanding, then we should pray for them. Are you ready for this? We should pray for them that they would be active in sharing their faith. So look at the person you're sitting next to whatever and say, active in sharing your faith. That's the prayer we should pray for them. If they want to have a fuller understanding of who they are in Christ, then we pray that they should be active in sharing their faith. So why would I say this? Why would we say this is the kind of prayer we should pray? Because we see Paul praying this exact prayer. Now, throughout this series, we've been kind of diving into some Paul's prayers and concerns that he shared with the early church and then saying, how does this impact in, in our lives today? Well, Paul prays this prayer for one of his friends named Philemon. I want to kind of give you some of the backstory here. It's an, an amazing story. You'll find it in a New Testament book. It's a really small, little tiny book in the New Testament with that title. It's a letter that Paul writes to Philemon. In fact, it's the only personal letter that's recorded in the scripture that Paul writes to someone else. Philemon was his friend, and I think from now on, let's just call him Phil. Does that sound good? Now just the person next to you say, hey, let's, let's call him Phil. That's, that's fine. Okay, we'll, we'll call him Phil. Paul writes this letter to his friend, Phil. Phil was a successful businessman who hosted 
a small church, let's just call it a life group, in his house every week. Paul's writing to this guy who's a successful businessman. He's a leader in the church. He hosts a life group. If you can picture this business guy inviting and having other believers come over to his house on a regular basis. But then one of his slaves, yeah, at this time there were still servants or slaves, uh, people that were indentured or maybe indebted and had to serve. So there was a slave named Onesimus that worked for Phil. That's kind of a cool name, Onesimus, right? Thinking about having kids in the future, maybe put that on your list. It'd be a really cool name, Onesimus, right? Well, Onesimus runs away from Philemon and his household, and he runs all the way to Rome, where apparently he meets the apostle Paul. And we don't know exactly how it happened, but we do know that he met the apostle Paul, and somehow through this encounter, Apostle Paul, or somebody else with Paul, leads Onesimus to Christ. Onesimus Onesimus places his faith and trust in Jesus. His life is massively transformed. It's kind of the real deal happening with him. There's all this stuff going on. And Onesimus says, hey, I I, I need to go back and make this right. I, I ran away. I did something I wasn't supposed to do. I need to go back and make it right. Jesus has changed my heart. So when Paul hears that Onesimus is going to go back, and he's going back to the home of Philemon, he decides that he's going to write a letter vouching for Onesimus. Basically, he writes, Philemon, you need to understand that Jesus has changed this guy's heart. And he writes a very heartfelt kind of emotional plea to Philemon, to his friend, this business owner, on behalf of Onesimus. This is where we're going to pick it up. Philemon, we're going to look right there in verse 4. So if you've got your Bible, you've got some notes, you want to jot a few things down, we're going to make a few key points today you might want to jot down. We're in Philemon, which is in your New Testament. We're going to look at verse 4. Paul writes this, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Would you read that line with me? I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Wow. What a beautiful letter. What a beautiful way to begin in his writing to Philemon. What Paul was really saying here is, hey, buddy, every time I pray, when I think about you, I give praise to God. And I remember you in prayer. And I'm thankful for you and for what you've done. And he says, I'm thankful for two reasons. One is because your faith in the Lord is so strong because of who you are in Christ. And he says, the second reason is because of your love for all the saints. So when I think about you, he says, I think about these things and I thank God for you. But he doesn't stop there. He thanks him for his faith and for his love for the saints. But then he says, I also pray that you'd be active in sharing your faith. We read it right there in verse 6. So don't miss this. He says, I want you to be active in sharing your faith. And I think this comes from his encounter with Onesimus. Remember, Paul's writing to him. Onesimus had ran away, is way far away in Rome, and now he's coming back. And Paul is engaging with Onesimus, and he's kind of like, hey, uh, you know, where are you going? He's like, I'm going back to Phil's house. He's like, hey, you know Phil? He's like, yeah, I know Phil. Yeah, Phil's an important business leader. And Paul's like, yeah, Phil is also a believer in Christ. He says, wait a minute, Onesimus, you worked for Phil for a long time, and you did not become a believer? You didn't even know about this Jesus thing. And so when Paul is writing here to Philemon, he's saying, hey, I see your faith in the Lord. I see how you love other people that are Christ followers and you invite them into your home and you share and you do Bible studies. It's all good stuff. He says, but I also pray that you would be active in sharing your faith. I pray that you'd be active in sharing your faith. Don't forget, 
Phil, to share your faith with others. And then when you do, you'll begin to understand more and more of the good things that you have in Christ. He says, I pray that you'll continue to be active in your faith. And I think Paul knows here something that is true even still today, and that is that Christ followers can sometimes get into a dangerous place of where their faith is always inward looking. How can I be fed? How can I grow? How does this benefit me? How does it, and it becomes this self-centered version of Christianity. Instead of loving those who are far from God or caring for them, we start judging them and we start complaining about them. Instead of having an attitude that's reaching out, we have an attitude that's trying to retreat and kind of circle the church wagons, if you will. But we know that the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven was not, hey, Christians, kind of just huddle together and, 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 and hide yourselves. No, Jesus said, go into the world and shine. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and make disciples. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. So as Christ followers, we're not supposed to run from darkness. We're supposed to shine in darkness. We're not supposed to huddle and be scared or nervous when there's tragedy or difficulty or calamity or things around us, but we're actually supposed to shine with the light of Christ. The problem is that sometimes we become so inward looking that we miss out on the opportunity to shine for Christ. Paul's telling Phil here in the scripture says, hey, don't do that. Always be active in sharing your faith. Now, I think if we kind of just talked about this or said it, you as a Christ follower would say, hey, yeah, I know that. I know, I know that's true. I know that's true. We should be sharing our faith. I should be shining as a light. But then I would ask you and I'd ask me, so why don't we share our faith like we should? I think there could be any number of reasons that challenge us or difficulty. But I, I think one of them is just life happens and we get busy. Maybe you've got kids. Maybe you've got work pressures. You've got other things going on that are challenging for you. And life happens and you just lose the importance of remembering to shine as a light for Christ. I think another reason sometimes is we don't want to be that weird person. We don't want to be that weird guy at work or that weird person where they're like, there's that guy always talking about God and other things like that. So we then just kind of uh, set it to the side and we kind of say, hey, we don't want to force our beliefs on anyone. And of course, we don't want to force anything on anyone, but we want to shine as a light. And sometimes not wanting to be that guy, we just then say, hey, I'm not going to say or do anything. But probably the biggest reason most of us don't share our faith is we feel like we simply don't know enough. We feel like if we knew more of the Bible or we could quote more or we could, you know, uh, do different things that come out of the scripture that then we would, okay, then I would share my faith. I was talking to a guy this week and he was telling me about how he was able to become an ordained minister in 20 minutes. So I guess you get online, you can fill out some paperwork or do whatever, you send it in, and then they'll send you something in the mail that you're now. So if you're scared about that, you can just get online and become an ordained minister today. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But I think sometimes we struggle with, hey, I'm not professional. Hey, I don't know enough. Here's the tension. If we understand that when we share our faith, when we're active, when we're living it out, Paul's implying here, then something happens as a result of that. He says, you grow in your understanding of God. He says, remember to be active in your faith, and when you do, you'll begin to understand more and more the good things you have in Christ Jesus. When we share our faith, Something positive happens, not only for the life of the person hearing it, those that are impacted and changed, something positive also happens in us. It may be that you're just planting a seed. It may be that someone else has planted a seed in their heart some other time, and you're just adding a little water to it. And God is the one who ultimately makes the difference in people's lives. And as you do this, and as you share, and as I share, then Paul says something amazing happens and we begin to experience more and more of the goodness of God. 
This is what happens when we get an outward-looking approach to our Christian faith, where our focus is towards other people, how we can bless them, how we can share the good news with them. Unfortunately, when we feel like we don't know enough or we don't have it all together, then we, we don't share our faith. And then people around us, their lives aren't impacted. And we then just become more and more insular, continuing just to look at our own selves or our own situation. And then we're not growing spiritually as God would want us to. We're not growing in a deeper understanding of God. We become just inward focused, maybe even stale or apathetic. I think that's why Paul would encourage us today. Hey, it is good to care for the other saints. It is good to, to love them and invite them into your home. And you're a man of faith or a woman of faith, he says. But also don't forget to be active in sharing your faith. Telling us as Christ followers to live with an outward focus. And as we do, then we'll experience positive spiritual momentum right even in our own lives. So in this series, we've been talking about when God's people pray and different things that Paul would lead us to pray for, whether that's praying for power or for grace. And we talked about boldness and we talked about uh, discernment and we talked about praying for what's best and we talked about praying for unity. Today, we're going to add to this and kind of conclude this series as we want to pray for each other that we would be active in sharing our faith. So if you've got teenagers... Pray for your teenagers that they be active in sharing their faith. If you've got kids, pray for them. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your friends. Pray for uh, the people in our church. Pray for the people in your life group. Pray even for me as your pastor. Yes, I need a lot of help in sharing my faith as well. I had a pretty big faith-sharing fail this past week. Now, there's this kind of common misconception that because I'm a pastor or somebody else is a pastor that somehow we're kind of, uh, you know, above reproach or, uh, you know, always just kind of floating uh, with a halo. And although, yes, I do believe there's something as being called by God to do a specific work in ministry that God has chosen you to do, there's also this idea that, hey, I'm just the guy. That will somebody say, hey, after all, he's just the guy. So this past week, I had been taking care of some stuff at the house uh, and had lunch, and I was heading over to the church office to do a little work. And not too long after I left the house, I got a call from my wife. And I got a call that there was a man uh, loudly and intimidatingly yelling at my youngest son outside along with uh, another boy from the neighborhood. The yelling was so loud and obnoxious and kind of gruff that Roxanne could hear it. And my other kids that were in the house could hear it even all the way down the basement with Dorsha. They could hear this kind of ferocious thing going on outside. Now, what I learned a, a little bit later was that the boys apparently had broken a small branch. Uh, they were trying to pull off some uh, flowers to take a picture of it. And the, the branch was a little weak. And, and so it fell off the tree. And this individual was very upset. Now, that wasn't in his uh, yard or anything. It was in kind of this public space, but where he was very upset that this damage had been done to this tree. So he was laying into these boys. So I've got this call from Roxanne on my phone, and I'm picturing this in my mind, and, you know, kind of the dad's juices start flowing. It's like, nobody's going to talk to my kids that way. And now I'm getting upset. Nobody's going to go after my boy. The hair on the back of my neck is standing up. I've whipped the car around. I'm heading back to the house. So I turn the car around. I, I get to this uh, individual's house, and I ring the doorbell. After I ring the doorbell, I do step back to continue social distancing. So I'm you know, not right up there. I'm trying to be mindful. But as he uh, answers the door, I let this gentleman know in no uncertain terms that he was in no way to yell at my son and that, that he had a problem with something that happened or something he had done, he could talk to me about it man to man instead of, you know, berating a little elementary school boy. That I was his father, I told him. Hey, I'm his father. If he's done something that's needing discipline, I will step in. I will address it. I said, I'm happy to give you my contact information. You can contact me anytime, but don't ever speak to him this way again because if you do, 
you and I are going to have a problem. Do you understand, I said to him. He said, fine. Then the next time it happens, which hopefully there won't be next time, he said, the next time it happens, I'm going to call the cops on them for vandalism. I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. You're telling me that you're going to call the cops on some elementary school boys for breaking a twig out here in the, in the middle of the road. I said, what kind of person are you? Now, in this conversation, a few minutes before is where I should have stopped, listened to my own sermons about when God's people pray, and I should have prayed and asked God for the right attitude and the right approach, because I didn't go in with the right attitude and the right approach. I went in full head of steam. And so he said, yeah, next time. I said, what kind of person are you? Why, why would you do that? I said, you're being such a, and I said a word, which I won't say here now, but it rhymes with casserole. And uh, that's when he then flipped the switch and he said a few things. And then he said to me, oh, I thought you were a pastor. And then he kind of said, uh, reverend really loud. And he slammed the door kind of on me and, and went inside. Now, you know, I, I think as any parent, you can relate to understand the need to stand up for your kids or make sure they're not being intimidated or bullied or addressed in a way that shouldn't be. And, that, and that's, that's the right course of action. But there is a better way to do it than the way I did it. Now, unfortunately, in this relationship, in this situation with this uh, gentleman, I will never be able to share my faith probably with him. Because I kind of broke that barrier by the way I interacted that didn't reflect in its totality how Christ would engage. So now I've lost the opportunity to be a light or to be a witness to him. But if I had taken the time to pray and consider and think about it, I could have maybe engaged it in such a way that it accomplished the goal of uh, you know, taking care of my kids and the need that was there, at the same time winning someone's heart over with the hopes of that maybe in the future at some point, not knowing the spiritual condition of him, that I might be able to share my faith. Not realizing that if someone is that upset, that angry over something so small and so minor that they're probably so miserable and so hurting deep down within and you can have empathy and compassion for where they're at. But I kind of missed all that. And now maybe I've lost a chance to share faith. So we need to pray that God would help us be active in sharing our faith. I told you, pray for each other. I said, pray for me so that as we go about our everyday lives, we can be in a place where we're sharing our faith so that others can come to know the love and joy that we experience in Christ. Now, let me give you a warning. If you start praying for this, if I start praying for this, God is going to give you opportunities to share your faith. Yes, even during quarantine. Whether it's maybe through social media or email or when you happen to be out doing an errand or something else, God's going to bring you opportunities. If you'll join me in praying for opportunities, God will bring them. So I'm just going to give you a couple quick tips on some ways that you can share your faith, kind of based loosely on some stories that we see in the New Testament. First of all, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. You can be loving but direct. You can be loving but direct. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is uh, preaching a powerful sermon, and he's kind of looking at these people who are far from God, and he's just letting them know the good news about Jesus. And then he says to them directly right there in Acts 2, you need to repent, and you need to turn and be baptized in the name of Jesus. This is direct. It's going right to where they are. He's perceiving at this moment that it's the right time to be direct with them. What he didn't say was, you know, kind of kicking the dust in the ground. Like, well, you know, you might need to explore different spiritual opportunities and think about a pathway that might feel comfortable for you. He didn't go on kind of this long diatribe kind of meandering around. He said, hey, no, you need to come to faith in Christ. He was loving and kind, but he was direct. There may be times when... God will lead you in love to be direct. Where the Holy Spirit will just prompt your heart and say, hey, this person is ready. They, they need to hear the good news about Jesus. They need to know that they actually need to repent and change their lives. Don't go around it. Just tell them it directly. 
Now, if you're doing that all the time, you're always being direct with everybody every, all the time about your faith, then guess what? Then you just turn into a jerk, right? So we don't, we, don't want, we don't want that. You have to be led by the Spirit. You have to be directed. But there is a time to be loving and direct. Number two, if you're taking notes, the second way you can share your faith, and all of us can do this, is simply to share your story. Share your story with somebody else. As followers of Jesus, every one of you, all of us, have stories we can share about what Jesus has done in our life. In fact, if you look in the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter, there's this amazing story of a guy who was born blind, and he comes and encounters Jesus, and he's healed, and he walks away, and he can see. Then the religious leaders, the, 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 the community leaders of the day started talking about, well, was this guy blind in the first place? Was he blind because his parents had done something bad? It, it, Jesus did this on the Sabbath day. Does that make Jesus a sinner? And they're, they're debating all these things, and they call the guy in, and the guy's kind of like, hey, I don't know about all this theology and all these rules and all these other things that you're debating, but what he said is, I can tell you one thing. Yesterday, I couldn't see you, and I couldn't see you for the last 40 years. But today, I can see you. And I'm sorry to tell you, fellas, you don't look that great. No, he didn't say that part. He said, hey, I can see you. Yesterday, I was blind. This is all I know. And now today, I see. And the reason I was blind and can see is because of that guy over there, Jesus, touched me and healed me and changed my life. He simply told his story. And when you're sharing your faith, that's all a witness does. In any court or any other place, when a witness is called, all they're supposed to share is what they've seen, what they've heard, what they have experienced themselves. You don't have to make anything up. You don't have to have you know, a, 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 a whole bunch of scripture references and indexes and all these other kind of things to do some kind of PowerPoint presentation to them. You simply just share your faith. And that's your greatest testimony. All I know is I used to be an addict, but I came to Jesus, and now I'm not. All I know is I used to be hurting and felt lost, but I came to Jesus, and, and now I've got peace in my soul. All I know is I used to not know where I was going. I was lost, and because of Jesus, now I feel at home. I belong. I'm found. You tell your story, and then watch God use your story to change other people's lives. It's always amazing how when you share your story and God has prompted you to do that, that, that'll intersect with somebody else's story. And maybe you didn't know it, but you'll be sharing your story about some pain or how God helped you to get through it. And they'll be like, oh, I lost a child. And they're like, oh, I lost a child too. Or, oh, I had, I had a broken marriage and here's what happened. And Jesus saved me and delivered me and put me on a new path. You say, oh, I've had a broken marriage too. Or I've been rejected by other people. Or I've had a bad church experience or whatever it might be. As you share your story with others, God will take that and it'll meet the other person right where they are. So to be active in sharing your faith, you can be loving and direct. Prepare yourself to share your story. Know what your story is and share that with others. Number three is just a really simple one. Invite others to join you. Invite somebody to church. Now, right now, that's even easier than ever, right? Because they don't even have to leave their house. You can invite them to join you and me and us online for worship. And through that, they can come to know and experience Christ. Nudge somebody and say, hey, you can invite someone. You can invite someone. And then when we're back able to worship together, you can invite them to come and join us right here in God's house. This is essentially what happened, again, in John's gospel in the fourth chapter, that there's a story of this woman who encounters Jesus. She's a sinful woman living a, a, a lifestyle that's, that's hurtful and broken, and Jesus encounters her, and she says, he says to her, you know, uh, you've come to get a drink, and, she, and, and he says, you know, well, why don't you have one of your husbands do it? And she's like, I don't have a husband. You know, she was, was living with a guy she wasn't married to. She had had like five husbands before, and then she's like, Wow. This guy, Jesus, knows his stuff. And Jesus says, hey, I don't think you're really thirsty for water. I think you're thirsty for something else. And then he shares with her the good news about the kind of life that he offers that will be like wells of springing water up in her heart and soul. Well, this so moved her 
that she kind of runs away from the oasis, from the well there, and she starts spreading it into the community. Hey, everybody, come back. She invites them to come with her back to the feet of Jesus. She says, hey, he's told me everything I've ever done. He knows about me. He's shown me the path, the way forward. She says, come, see, come, be a part of what this guy Jesus is doing. That's simple. You and I can do that same thing. Just invite other people to come. Invite them to come and experience God's presence. And then finally, the fourth thing you could do to be active in sharing your faith is we can live a life that other people want. Live a life that other people want. For us to be the kind of people that other people would say, wow, there's something different about that person. There's something going on in them. They have a peace. They have something that I don't have. Again, there's a story in the book of Acts, and it was the story of Paul and Silas. And they had been arrested and were in prison, and some people were praying and that they'd be released. And in the middle of this, there's this earthquake, and the, 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 the jail doors uh, break open, and uh, the, uh, Paul and Silas, the apostles, are freed. They can go. They can take off. Well, the jailer who was in charge of all this says, oh, man, they're gone the rulers come and see that they're gone. The prisoners are gone. I'm going to be killed anyway. So he says, I might as well do it easy myself. And he's about to take his own life. And then Paul and Silas are like, hey, wait a minute. No, no, no. Hey, we're still here. We haven't gone anywhere. They were showing this jailer some major love. Well, in that moment, the jailer has this conversion experience. And he says, wow, what's different about you guys that in this situation, you wouldn't flee, but you'd actually show me love. He says, I want what you have. What's going on in your heart and in your life that you would live this way towards others? When your life is transformed by the grace of God, I believe that we can live in such a way that others are hungry for what we have. That's one of the reasons we're going to pray. God, give us opportunities to share our faith. God, we pray for those that we love around us. Give us the character and the strength to live the kind of life that you would want so that other peoples would want what we have. And when we pray that kind of prayer, when God's people pray, how many of you know that he hears and answers that prayer? And when we're active in sharing our faith, when we're living this kind of life, as I wrap up this morning, let me show you what will happen. The first thing is this, you get to play a part in someone else's divine story. You get to play a part in someone else's spiritual journey. Think about that. You play a small part in what God might be doing in the trajectory of someone else's life that will last for eternity. You get to play a part in someone else's story. What else will happen when we're active in sharing our faith is your faith will grow. Your faith will grow and grow and grow. And you'll be having a conversation with somebody and the next thing you're like, oh, wow, you know, a scripture comes to you and you share it with them. And then and, and, and you're like, wow, God just spoke to me through me to them and revealed this verse to me because I had been reading it before. As you're active in your faith and you're talking with others about it, it will start to grow inside of you. And the final thing, as we're active in sharing our faith, is you'll be reminded of what you have in Christ. You'll be reminded of who you are in Christ. Think about that. That's how you have this fuller understanding. You're telling other people about the grace of God. You're telling other people about the gospel and the, the good news of forgiveness and the love of God that's expressed through Jesus. And then as you're sharing that, it's almost sometimes like you're hearing it again for the first time yourself and you're reminded of how much God loves you. And you get to have this more full and robust understanding of exactly all that you have in Christ. Knowing and understanding who you are embracing God's promises. You always say, hey, you know, you're not going to have a perfect life. It's not always just everything just falls in place and goes together, but you will have someone who will walk with you through it 
all. Just like you've experienced yourself. What a powerful thing to have the very spirit of God moving in our lives, equipping us, comforting us, strengthening us as we are actively sharing our faith with others. So when God's people pray, we're gonna pray that he would help us. I'm gonna pray for you. You're gonna pray for me. We're gonna pray for each other. Help us to be active in sharing our faith because when we do, we'll see lives around us restored and we'll even grow ourselves. So there at home this morning, if you'd join me in praying this week, I want you to lift your hand up wherever you are. That's it, do it right there. Yeah, I will join you in praying that God will help us be active in sharing our faith. And I believe God's gonna hear your prayer. He's gonna hear my prayer and God's gonna do some pretty awesome things even in the circumstances we're in. Because when God's people pray, he hears and answers. In fact, let's do that together right now. Just in this moment, you just maybe bow your head, close your eyes. Let's talk to God. Father, I thank you for our church family that loves each other so dearly and so connected. I pray, God, that you'd help each one of us be active in sharing our faith. I pray, God, that even this week, there would be opportunities for us to share the good news about Jesus. God, I thank you that we will have these opportunities, and I pray that you would help us to share the story. I pray, God, that you would help us to be living the kind of life that others would want to know. I pray, God, that your spirit would flow in and through us, that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to discern the right time, the right place to share this good news. God, I pray that this would be a part of our lives today and every day, that we would actively share our faith in you. And as we do, that together, we'd more fully know and love you. We ask these things through Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Would you say amen? Amen. Let's sing together.
our prayer this morning. God, we need you. We want to live that kind of life that others would want. So we say, God, we need you and we invite you in. Help us to be active in sharing our faith with others. Now, if you're watching this morning and your spiritual story hasn't begun, but you feel a stirring on your heart, and you're saying that I need you, Jesus. If that's your prayer today, God, I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. If you'll pray that right now, invite Christ into your heart, surrender and yield yourself to him. God will hear your prayer and your spiritual journey will begin today. And then you'll have a story to tell others. God bless you guys. I want you to have a great week. Remember, you can text to give now. Text to 84321, and the amount goes in there. We appreciate you. We'll see you again in a few days.